Jumbo, everyone. <clears throat> it's good to be back with you. And to my brothers and sisters in Kenya, you can see that I really appreciate the gift that you gave. Uh, I appreciate all the gifts that you uh, give uh, to me. And you gave me this wonderful, um, uh, I forget what you call it, uh, scarf, I guess it is. And I just wanted to wear that for a little bit until I get too hot. And then up above me, you can see one of the other gifts that you gave me as well. It's on my bookshelf. Um, the family that prays together stays together with the elephant tusks, which are not real. And then, of course, in the background, you can see the the Africa um, uh, beautiful thing that you gave me that I, I haven't found the right place to hang it up yet. And then the Kenya book is just something that I bought myself as a as a travel book just to learn more about the areas of Kenya. Well, we're ready to get into our next section, and that is uh, Jesus, the kingdom, and the parables about the kingdom. So let's go to paragraph number one. Now that we have done a brief overview of the kingdom, let's transition to um, another another overview of Jesus teaching about the kingdom in his parables. The kingdom of God is the central teaching of scripture. Did you know that? Isn't that amazing? But it really is. The kingdom of God is the central teaching of scripture. You have the kingdom, man's kingdom and you have God's kingdom. Uh, not surprisingly, Jesus taught more on or about the kingdom of God than any other subject. And that's why I'm spending um, a great deal amount of time about the kingdom of God before we actually get to the parables of the kingdom, which we're actually going to get to right now. Paragraph 2, Jesus began his ministry by announcing that the kingdom of God had arrived. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, and let's look at verse 17. Matthew chapter 4, uh, from that time, verse 17, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember what he said to Nicodemus, Unless you are born from above, and you can only be born from above or born again by repentance. And he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then down further in verse 23, Jesus was going about, was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And um, then in paragraph number three of your notes, Jesus declared that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. That's all the way at the end of his ministry, Matthew 24. Paragraph 4, his teaching was designed to show men how they might enter the kingdom of God. Again, we saw that with Nicodemus in John 3, but let's look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. Um, he's saying to his disciples, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He is not teaching justification by works. He is What he's teaching is the, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees was outward. The righteousness of those who are in the kingdom has to be inward. And it all begins uh, by faith, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, how we might enter the kingdom. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're born again by faith through grace, but we develop fruit through an ongoing obedience uh, to Jesus Christ. Paragraph number um, five his mighty works, that is Jesus' mighty works, were intended to prove that the kingdom of God had come upon the people or come 
among the people. And so that's in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 28. Matthew 12, verse 28. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So it is a spiritual uh, reign. Um, again, paragraph 5, his mighty works were intended to prove that the kingdom of God had come upon the people and it thus was superior to this, to this natural realm. Paragraph number 6, Jesus' parables illustrated to his disciples and to all people the truth about the kingdom, the truth about the kingdom. If you'll turn with me to Matthew 13 and verse 11. Matthew 13, verse 11, Jesus answered to them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. By the way, the Greek word for mysteries in the New Testament is not something that is mysterious or that can't be understood. It actually means something that was hidden, but it now is revealed. So we don't need to go around as preachers of the gospel saying, well, I have this mystery, and I have this mystery, and I have this revelation from God, but you don't have it. No, the mysteries of the kingdom are revealed to those who want to know the truth. That's what the parables are all about. It's the same truth revealed to all of us. The challenge is whether we all heed that truth, that is, whether we obey it. Then paragraph number seven, accordingly, Jesus' teaching by use of the parables indeed described some aspect of the kingdom. No one parable describes every, every single thing there is about the kingdom, but each parable um, brings, an as brings out an aspect of the kingdom. Paragraph number eight, the expectation of the people of Jesus' day was that the kingdom of God would dramatically break into history and suddenly and decisively and triumphantly destroy man's rebellion against God. That was the expectation of the time. But paragraph 9, this is true, but Jesus' teaching shows the people of his day that before the cataclysmic inbreaking of the kingdom of God declared by the Old Testament prophets, the Messiah would introduce the kingdom of God in an unexpected manner. That is why Nicodemus did not understand, um, he clearly did not understand the kingdom of God. He thought he did, but Jesus basically taught him, you don't understand the kingdom of God, but I'll explain it to you. Paragraph 10, that is, the kingdom would not necessarily come solely, only, by an overpowering outward display of signs. It had actually come, and it actually already come in the presence of Jesus, in the person of Jesus, and it would increase through his teaching and through his ministry. If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 17. I love the Gospel of Luke. Luke 17 and verse 20. G, uh, Luke tells us, Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming. You see, the Pharisees had their idea, according to Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and so on and so forth. They were partially right, but not totally right. And Jesus answered them and said, The kingdom is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. It had already arrived in Jesus. It, it was already, but not yet. The ultimate prophecies from the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, and we just read about Isaiah, Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 11, that will happen, and it will be sudden, it will be decisive, it will be powerful. We read, that, we read about that in Revelation 20 as well. But initially, it doesn't come with overwhelming power. It comes with, um, with, 
with the power of the, of the Word of God to change lives. Paragraph 11, Jesus' parables would answer the misunderstanding current among the Jews that the kingdom of God must come with irresistible power at once. That would indeed happen in the last days, but it would also be a present, though not full, reality. Now, this could be seen, for example, through the parable of the sower, which can be found in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and in a much abbreviated uh, way in Luke 8. But the kingdom's growth would be like leaven. It would be gradual. Excuse me. But its seeming insignificance, paragraph number 13, must not be taken to be valueless. It was indeed a pearl of great price to be sought for with all of one's devotion. Paragraph 14, Jesus' parables taught that the presence of the kingdom now in him and later through his disciples meant that the world would not yet be judged. And that's what the scribes and the Pharisees were looking for. They wanted Israel to come out from, among, from, from underneath the domination of the Roman Empire and excuse me uh, they expected uh, the kingdom of Israel to rule the nations that will happen but not yet paragraph number 15 indeed even unbelievers would be allowed to grow together with true believers <laughs> thus in the parable of the wheat and the tares Jesus shows that he gives every person the best opportunity to repent of sin while he or she witnesses so many aspects of the kingdom of God now. Paragraph 16. Moreover, the eschatological, eschatology is, is the study of last things. Eschaton in Greek is last and ology is logos, um, which is the study of. So it's the study of last things. We know it commonly as end times. Uh, but eschatology is a theological word. So, uh, koro. <laughs> uh, moreover, before the eschatological climactic inbreaking of the kingdom of God, the very king of that kingdom himself, and this is what the Jews could not understand, he would first have to die a substitutionary death before anyone could even be justified to be an eternal part of his kingdom. And it's there in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, but, but the Jews did not see it. Hence, paragraph 17, <clears throat> God's kingdom is completely unlike man's kingdom ruled man's kingdoms ruled as they are with forceful power God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom where he serves his subjects and where he even lays down his life for his subjects remember even Jesus disciples wanted him to rule and reign they wanted to sit on the throne of Israel judging the 12 tribes of Israel they did not want him to go to the cross. They did not have a full understanding of what the kingdom of God is all about, right? And, and that's the parables will help us to have that understanding. Which brings me to paragraph number 18. Having done this, however, his kingdom will finally come with great power and glory, but not at the present time. It is at that time that men who refuse to repent will be judged, and all possibility of repentance will be too late. And that is what we see in the parable of the ten virgins. That illustrates another aspect of the kingdom of God. I am, as, I, as we go over this, I'm getting really excited about getting into all those parables. Paragraph number 19, when Jesus taught his followers to pray, Concern for the kingdom was a major part of that pattern of prayer. Remember, the kingdom of God is God's 
righteous rule and reign. Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. I think maybe until this moment, we have taken this part of the Lord's pattern of prayer for granted. So when Jesus teaches the disciples to pray, and those of you in Ken, you remember we went through the Lord's pattern of prayer extensively. The first segment or section of that prayer, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, is just a time to focus on our Heavenly Father and focus on Him for who He is, not for what He can do for us. Praise Him, worship Him, and then as the Holy Spirit leads us, we move into the second segment of prayer. So that first segment of prayer, it could be five minutes, it could be five hours, it could be five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, you know, that's, that's between us and the Holy Spirit. But then we move into the second aspect of that kingdom, and that's the time where we begin to pray for God's purposes to be done in the earth. And Jesus puts it this way, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're part of that kingdom, so we can pray, we can include ourselves in that, but that's when we can pray for the nation of Kenya, for the leadership of Kenya, for righteousness to be done in Kenya. That's when we can pray for uh, the church in Kenya, the pastors in Kenya, to walk in humility and biblical accuracy and all those things. Uh, that's when you can all pray for me as well. Thank you very much. And there's so many things that, that can be prayed in that section alone. Again, it could be five minutes. It could be 10 minutes. It could be 20 minutes. It could be 30 minutes. It could be longer. However the Holy Spirit leads. And then in verse 11, that's the point in the pattern of prayer where Jesus says, all right, I know that you have needs. The Father knows that you have needs. This is the time for you to express those needs on a daily basis. This pattern of prayer is a daily pattern of prayer. How do we know that? Because in verse 11 he says, Give us this day our daily bread. It's a beautiful pattern. Jesus knows that we have needs. He's telling us that the Father wants to meet those needs. But what he's saying is, bring them up, but don't bring them up right away. First, take your time. Don't rush into prayer. Just focus on the Father, then focus on what concerns Him, and then focus on what concerns you, which actually does concern Him. And then in the rest of the part of the prayer, it is an opportunity for us to pause and allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts for any sin and to allow Him to uh, propel us to forgive others who have offended us. The brilliancy of this prayer is that it keeps our hearts clean from sin and it keeps our hearts clean from bitterness towards others. Well, that's not all. And then he says at the end, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, literally in Greek, it is the evil one. The last part of that prayer is to engage in spiritual warfare. I've gone up astray from what I wanted to teach on, but I, I think that was still important. That brings me to paragraph number 20 in your notes. Regarding Jesus' call to us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, Lad, again, this is um, Lad's book, he notes the confidence that this prayer is to be answered when God brings human history to the divinely ordained consummation enables the Christian to retain his balance and sanity of mind in this mad world in which we live. Our hearts go out to those who have no such hope. Thank God his kingdom is coming and it will fill all the earth. You know, Ladd wrote those words not in 2016. When did he write this book? Uh, the copyright is 1959. If Ladd could call this world a mad world, a crazy world in 1959, just think of how much worse off it's gotten since then. Back in the, in the 1950s, they didn't know much about terrorism. Terrorism began in 19, 
70s and the world just is is going insane the immorality that's that's taking place in our nation is just reprehensible it's unbelievable that that our president would force schools to open bathrooms for transgender people even among small children that's how twisted and wicked the minds of men can be and then he, our president has the audacity to look down at anybody that disagrees with him and call us immoral Isaiah says woe to those who call what is good evil and evil good but he's not the only one we see that throughout the world but you're not seeing it in Kenya yet hold firm uh, because the forces of evil are trying to get to the nation of Kenya to to loosen its view of homosexuality and so on and so forth and um, anyway I'll, I'll leave it at that uh, paragraph number 21 on the eve of his death Jesus assured his disciples that he would yet share with them the happiness and the fellowship of the kingdom. So you see how extensive the kingdom of God, the teaching of the kingdom of God is. Uh, Luke 22, Luke 22, this is the, um, the Last Supper. Luke 22, and... Um, let me just jump to verse 30. No, let me go to verse 28. Luke 22, verse 28. He says, You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Isn't that amazing? Now, Jesus' kingdom is not any different than the kingdom of God. He's the king of the kingdom of God. But he's including us in that rule and reign. And there's a coming a time when the kingdom of God will come in its fullness and we will eat and drink at his table in his kingdom. That's just remarkable. Finally, paragraph number 22, in this brief survey of Jesus and the kingdom, we can see that he promised that he would appear again on the earth in glory to bring in the blessedness of the kingdom to those for whom it was prepared. Uh, let's look at Matthew 25 and verse 31 and 34. Matthew 25 verse 31 and 34 Matthew you know in all the people that I've met in in Kenya I've never run into a Matthew are there many Matthews in Kenya because I love how you all use uh, so many people have biblical names but um, among all the pastors and leaders I've met uh, no Matthews that I recall sorry I'm getting a little random here I'm getting tired so I'm getting silly but um, I just love the name Matthew because that's my middle name and it means gift of God. Anyway, verse 31 of Matthew 21, But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. And then in verse 34, Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. <laughs> Is that not amazing? That's just, think about that. The Father prepared His kingdom for us before the foundation of the world. That is just, how can you put it into words? Paragraph 23. Jesus' church is a part of the kingdom, but it does not equal the kingdom. The church consists of the people of the kingdom who receive that kingdom, 
who witness to it, and who will one day fully inherit it. Therefore, as it does its work, especially through the preaching of the gospel, the church advances the kingdom. That's paragraph number 24. Let me repeat that again. Therefore, as it does its work, paragraph 24, especially through the preaching of the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, the church advances the kingdom. How do we enter the kingdom of, uh, of heaven? By being born again. Then once we're born again, we're citizens of the kingdom. And then we learn from the word of God how to live as citizens of the kingdom. Again, that's what the parables are all about. That leads us to paragraph 25. So Lad writes, The gospel must not only offer a personal salvation in the future life to those who believe. It must also transform all of the relationships of life here and now and thus cause the kingdom of God to prevail in the world. The gospel of redeeming grace has the power to save the social, economic, and political orders as well as the soul of individual believers. So it's like I just said, the salvation is just the entry into the kingdom. Then as we live out the kingdom and how we do business, I, I gave you the testimony uh, earlier uh, of my own time in working in, in, in business and outside sales and how, how my, my lifestyle impacted others. But as Christians are honest and men and women of integrity in selling products or in farming or bringing products to market or selling clothes or, or whatever it is that we do, as we are honest in our dealings with others and as, as we pray in Christian politicians and they do what is right for the nation and they're not worried about putting money in their own back pocket. People see that. It gives them hope. And the kingdom of God then begins to transform society. And that is what is needed so desperately in the nation of Kenya, throughout Africa, and in the United States. So that brings me to paragraph number 26. The kingdom is a present spiritual reality. So that's when Romans 4, 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. What it means by that is it's not, the kingdom of God is not only, um, there's an exaggeration to make a point. The kingdom of God is not solely concerned with material things, but at its foundation, it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. But again, it's only entered into and enjoyed by conversion through faith in Jesus Christ. Paragraph 27, those who reject God's gracious and eternal offer of entrance into this kingdom will be shut out for eternity. Read Revelation 22, 14 through 17. Why? Because they have rejected Jesus' work on the cross to redeem them from sin so that they can enter into the kingdom. Paragraph 28, the parables of Jesus make it clear that in some sense, the kingdom is present and at work in the world. The parables, parables teach us how to live in that kingdom and how to extend that kingdom. Paragraph 29, the kingdom is both a reign, that is a rule, Matthew 6.10, 33, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. But it's, it's both a reign and a realm, a realm. And we, we, there are some verses there for you as well, which I recommend that you, uh, that you take a look at. Paragraph number 30, Application. Thus the believer in Jesus Christ has everything to live for now and yet everything to look forward to 
uh, uh, everything to look forward to for eternity when he or she lives without sin's horrible effects. Beloved, there a day is coming when sin will be no more. Again, how do we put words into, into those truths and realities? A day is coming when I will not have to deal with sin. A day is coming when I will no longer have to ask for forgiveness. I will no longer have to repent. I will no longer have to grieve at my own sin. That day is coming. Yes, it is. It's an amazing thing. Paragraph 31. Now we seek to bring glory and honor to our King in everything that we do. Please look at Colossians 3.23. Because we are citizens of the kingdom, and we want to show forth the glory of our benevolent King to everyone, believer and non-believer alike. Paragraph 32, I offer an extended quote now from Ladd, which is still a succinct and superb summary of the kingdom explained in Jesus' parables for this age. He writes, It is not now destroying human rule. It is not now abolishing sin from the earth. It is not now bringing the baptism of fire that John had announced. It has come quietly, unobtrusively, secretly. It can work among men and never be recognized by the crowds. In the spiritual realm, the kingdom now offers to men the blessings of God's rule, delivering them from the power of Satan and sin. He writes, the kingdom of God is an offer, a gift, which may be accepted or rejected. The kingdom is now here with persuasion rather than with power. Now that's, that's not altogether true. Um, it's, it's really a both and. We need to move in the power of the Holy Spirit and demonstrate the supernatural power of the kingdom of God. But still, in the preaching of the kingdom, and even in the demonstration of the kingdom, people can respond or reject. They can, people see healings today, they see the miraculous, and what do they do? They mock at it, they laugh at it. They hear the, preacher, the, the gospel preached, and they reject it, right? So it's both and, not an either or. Each of the parables, he writes, in Matthew 13, illustrates this mystery of the kingdom that the kingdom of God, which is yet to come in power and great glory, is actually present among men in advance. That's a key word, in advance. In an unexpected form to bring to men in the present evil age the blessings of the age to come. <coughs> that is a very, very insightful powerful quote, isn't it? Excuse me. Let me read that last part again. The kingdom of God, which is yet to come in power and great glory, is actually present among men in advance, in advance, in an unexpected form to bring to men in the present evil age the blessings of the age to come. Paragraph 33, Beloved, we're about to see the incredible wisdom and plan of God unfolded to us in the parables of Jesus. These are His words given to us in Scripture for eternity. Paragraph 34, We're also about to see and hopefully be amazed and how highly Jesus takes his word. A question for you and for me. Do you value his word and apply it eagerly to your life? Paragraph 35. Observe for yourself the amount of Christians who are so casual 
with respect to following Jesus and abiding in his word. Observe for yourself also that their maturity in him is nowhere near where it should be because they really do not listen to his word. That is tragic indeed, isn't it? Well, that's that. we're done with that section. And now, what I want to do here at this point is in your notes, I'm asking you to now roll up your sleeves and work hard with observations uh, for the parable of the sower. For those of you, especially who are in Kenya, we're going back to principles of Bible study. And so what I'd like you to do now is take, uh, for whoever is leading this, make sure that all the men and women take at least 30 minutes, no less than that, at least 30 minutes, and go through all of the observations that I list for you. Um, and I know it might seem tedious, but, but what's happening here is you're developing skills to become better students of Scripture. You're developing skills to see, uh, to see more of what's in Scripture and not just read past it. So this is a, an exercise that I did in seminary, and it is an exercise that I am still doing today. I'm still doing this today. What I'm asking you to do, I'm still doing more than 25 years after seminary. When I'm reading my Bible, I still use these principles of observation, of interpretive questions, and then of application. So I want you to do this now. I want you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. And I want you to either do this individually Maybe there's a couple ways of approaching it. You could do it individually for 15 minutes and then get into small groups and share the observations that you've made. Or you can get into small groups of two or three now and do these observations. So go through the questions. I'm sorry, first read Mark 4, 1 through 20. Then go through the questions and do do what it what it says here. Paragraph one, count the amount of times the word seed or it, referring to the seed, and seeds or they, referring to the seeds, appear in this parable. Paragraph number two, to whom is Jesus speaking this parable to? Be careful in your answer. It's right there in the text, but be careful. Paragraph three, how many times does Jesus use the word listen or hear in the parable? You'd be surprised. Paragraph 4, how many times the, does the word understand appear in the parable? Paragraph 5, how many times does the word sower appear in the parable? And so on and so forth. Let me see if there's anything else that, um, that I, I find here that maybe I need to um, explain. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. But once, once you're finished with these questions then um, then I'll come back on in in the video and then give you the answers that is the answers are just what I've observed so there's no it's not like I have all the answers this is just what I've done myself you might you might find better app, uh, better observations than I do or better um, interpretive questions or better applications uh, this is just my work um, and so why don't you pause the video now and, and do that exercise. Again, take at least 30 minutes, um, probably no more than 45 minutes, and then come back together and then watch the video and I'll continue, okay? Please, please do that now.
Okay, are you ready? <clears throat> I'm ready to give you the, the answers or my observations for the questions that I ask you. Um, the, the answer to paragraph number one is the word seed or it referring to the seed or seeds and or they referring to the seeds appears 14 times in verses 1 through 9 and 17 times total taking into account verses 16, 18, and 20. In Jesus' explanation of the parable, seed becomes the word in verses 14 through 20, so you want to see the transition there. In this, in this exercise of making observations, we want to be able to see how Jesus transitions from seed to the word. And the word, or it, referring to the word, appears 11 times. So combining seed and word, Jesus refers to this 28 times in this parable. At this point, we might ask the, in, uh, the interpretive question, what does this mean? Why is this significant? And the answer would be, of course, that the parable is all about the Word of God and what someone does with the Word, whether they accept it or neglect it or reject it. If they accept it, here's how much they can grow. If they reject it, then he makes it clear what's, what happens. Paragraph number two, to whom is Jesus speaking this parable to? The answer is the crowd, which Jesus refers to as a very large crowd. I hope you noticed that in verse 1. Remember I said, be careful with your answer. And the whole crowd in verse 1, thus emphasizing and describing the audience twice. Now, the disciples were part of the crowd. So technically you could say he was speaking the parable to the crowd and the disciples, but originally the disciples were part of the crowd. A good observation would be to, to note a progression from the crowd to the disciples or a contrast between the crowd and the disciples. But either way, we should observe that. Paragraph 3, how many times does Jesus use the word listen or hear in the parable? Nine times. Interpretive question, what is important about that or why is that important? Or what does this mean? Clearly, when you, when you repeat something nine times, then, then that word becomes extremely important, right? And, and so, what is the parable all about? It is about hearing the Word of God, right? And there's different categories of hearers. Those are, there are those who are the casual hearers, which is the crowd. They heard it, and they left. And they never asked for an explanation for for the parable like the disciples did. But then there are categories of here. Those are people that hear the word, but then persecution comes and they they fade away. There are people who hear the word, but the desire for riches and other things enter in and choke out the word. So it's all about how we hear. And and the kingdom of God is rooted and grounded in the Word of God, and that's how we produce fruit, is how the Word of God operates in our lives. Paragraph 4, how many times does the word understand appear in the parable? Three times. Paragraph 5, how many times does the word sower appear in the parable? Only twice. How many times does the word sow, verse paragraph 6 appear, or sown? Seven. And, um, Paragraph 7, how many times does the word soil appear? Four. Um, what contrast do you see? Paragraph 8, I see a contrast between the immediate mention of the crowd in verse 1 and the mention of his followers along with the 12. Did you see that? Because we immediately just jumped to the 12, but that, that there's more than that. There are his followers. This is getting too hot now. There are his followers and the twelve. In verse 10, but no more mention of the crowd. There's a contrast there. I see a contrast 
um, between soil in verse 5 and good soil in verses 8 and 20. I see a contrast between four areas or types of soil in verses 4 through 8. I see a contrast between 30, 60, and 100 fold in verse 8. Where do you find an explanation of the parable? Paragraph 9, question 9. I see an explanation of the parable in verses 14 through 20, where what is described in verses 4 through 8 is explained in verses 14 through 20. Paragraph 10, or question number 10, what are the explanations? Well, in the first category of seed sown, which Jesus says in verse 14 is the word, the birds are now explained as representing Satan in verse 15. In the second category of where the seed or the word was sown, or the second soil, the rocky places, verses 5 and 6, is explained in verses 16 and 17. The rocky places turns out to be people who immediately receive the word with joy. The seed which immediately sprang up, verse, 15, verse 5, is now explained as a person who immediately receives that word with joy in verse 16 and so on and so forth. You can read all these, of course. I don't need to read uh, all of them. They're all, they're all in your notes. And my voice is going anyway. Um, so I think they're all, all the explanations are there. Um, just looking to see if there's anything I need to explain. It's all, I think it's all straightforward. Um, and yeah, it's all, it's all there in your notes. Uh, there's a lot more. A whole lot more. But I do, I do urge you to go through all this. Take your time to go through all of it. And um, then next, we're actually going to get into uh, my teaching on the parables uh, of Jesus. So I'm going to give you a lot of insights um, into the parables of Jesus. Well, as we get ready to close this section, I just want to uh, pray a blessing over everyone uh, but for those in Kenya, I want to do it in the Luo language. And so, just if you'll just lift your hands. Nguono mar ruothwa Yesu Christo. Hera mar nyesai wongwa. Kod achiel mawango kuom roho maler. Obed kodwa duto nyaka cheng. Amina. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. God bless you.